And in Egypt, this polarity was referred to as Set, and Set was sown contrasted with Horus, and actually there would be an empowerment of the Pharaoh by both Horus and Set when the Pharaoh would take the throne. That term Set, when the uh, Hebrew people left Egypt, led by Moses, who had been initiated in the Egyptian temples, that term Set became Ha Setan, and so Set became Satan. Now, Ha Setan is a Hebrew term meaning the adversary, and so it means that this is a being that has an adversarial relationship to the human being. And so that's where we then got the concept in the West of Satan. Again, this is a, a dark type of being, very different from the Luciferic beings as beings of light evolution of the earth. If we ask how the human being has developed since earliest times up to the present day, we must first recall what has been said about the being of man. Man has seven members. The first is, so to speak, the lowest. The etheric body is higher and of finer texture. The astral body is still higher and finer. Of the ego body, only the first rudiments yet exist. It would be wrong to conclude that the highest body now possessed by man is the most perfect and the physical body the most imperfect. Exactly the opposite is true. The physical body is the most perfect part of the human being. Later on the higher members will of course reach a higher degree of perfection but at present the physical body is in its way the most highly developed it has been constructed with ineffable wisdom. We must realize that it is not only man who goes through successive incarnations, but that the law of reincarnation applies universally. All beings and all the planets are subject to this law. The earth, with everything that is on it, has passed through earlier incarnation. Our sun is a fixed star. The old sun was a planet and in the course of its incarnations it has worked itself up from the substance and being of a planet to the rank of a fixed star. But we must not picture these four planets, Saturn, Sun, Moon and Earth, as four separate planets. They are four different conditions of the same planet. They are true metamorphoses of the one planet and all the beings that belong to it are metamorphosed with it. Man has never been on any other planet, but the Earth has existed in these four different conditions. A metamorphosis such as this, from the spiritual into the physical and then back again into the spiritual, is called in theosophy a round or a life state. Each round can be divided into seven phases, arupa, rupa, astral, physical, and back to Arupa. These phases, wrongly called globes, are in fact, quote, form states, close quote. But we must not imagine seven successive planets. It is always the same planet which transforms itself, and its beings are transformed with it. Saturn passed through seven such rounds or life states. In each round, its structure was being perfected so that only in the seventh round was its final perfected form attained. Each round is subdivided into seven transformations, or form states, so that Saturn would have passed through seven times seven, or forty-nine, metamorphoses. That is true of Saturn, and then of Sun, Moon, and Earth. And in the future there will be three more planets, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. Thus there, there are thus seven planets, each going through seven rounds, and each round through seven form states, expressed as 777 in occult script. In that script, seven is the unit position, excuse me, in that script, seven in the unit position means the globes, in the tens, the rounds, and in the hundreds, planets. We, therefore, have to multiply the figures, and so we find that our planetary system has to pass through 7 by 7 by 7, or 343 transformations. This planetary stage will be followed in the future by three others, Jupiter, Venus, Vulcan. These seven stages of the Earth, as recorded in occult science, are preserved in the days of the week. 
Saturn, Saturday, Samedi, Samstag. Sun, Sunday, Sonntag. Moon, Monday, Lundi, Montag. Mars, Mardi, or Tew, Tuesday. Mercury, Mercredi. Woden, Wednesday. Jupiter, Udi, Tor, Donner, Thursday. Venus, Vendredi, Freya, Friday. Thus do the names of the days of the week reflect the occult doctrine of the passage of the earth through these various stages. A remarkable chronicle, which makes it possible for these truths to be kept ever and again in mind. The seven consciousness states. Number one, trance or universal consciousness, Saturn. Number two, deep sleep or dreamless consciousness, Sun. Three, dream or picture consciousness, Moon. Four, waking or object consciousness, Earth. Five, psychic or conscious picture consciousness, Jupiter. Six, trans-psychic or conscious sleep consciousness, Venus. Seven, spiritual or conscious universal consciousness, Vulcan. The seven life states or rounds or realms. Number one, first elemental realm. Two, second elemental realm. Three, third elemental realm. Four, mineral realm. Five, plant realm. Six, animal realm. Seven, human realm. The seven form states or globes. One, Arupa. Two, Arupa. Three, astral. Four, physical. Five, sculptural. Six, intellectual. Seven, archetypal. Each form state passes in turn through seven times seven states. Our present state, for example, the fourth form state of the mineral realm of the fourth planet Earth, passes through the so-called seven root races, and each root race in turn through a further seven subdivisions, for example, the cultural epochs of our present fifth root race. After each round occurs a short pralaya, sleep condition, and after every consciousness state, a long pralaya. When the earth reappeared out of the darkness of pralaya, it did not emerge alone. It was at first united with the sun and our present moon. Sun, moon and earth formed one huge body. This was the first stage of our planet. At that time, the earth consisted of a very, very tenuous substance. There were no solid minerals, no water, only this subtle material we call ether. The whole body was thus a planet made up of fine etheric material and surrounded by an atmosphere of spirit, in the same way as our own earth is surrounded by air. This spirit atmosphere contained everything which today constitutes the human soul. Your souls, which today have come down into your bodies, were at that time up above in this spirit atmosphere. The earth was a vast globe of ether, very much bigger than our earth today, and surrounded by spiritual substance which contained the souls of mankind. Down below in the rarefied substance of the etheric globe, something rather denser was present, millions of shell-like forms. These were the human germs of the Saturn stage, now emerging as a recapitulation. The resulting forms were thus brought forth directly by the spiritual worlds. In the beginning there was a confused interwoven ether substance, much denser than the homogeneous divine spiritual substance which stretched forth its arms to create the forms out of chaos. This first epoch of our earth is well described in the book of Genesis. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. Close quote. The ether, is, as it then was, is called water in occult science. You could not then have seen the earth or the shell-like forms. They were resounding human forms, and each one, as it came into being, 
expressed itself through a specific note. The forms possessed no individuality. And because of the departure of the sun, objects could now, for the first time, be illuminated from outside. All our seeing depends on the fact that the sun's rays fall on some object and are reflected back. When the sun withdrew, there were now bodies in existence on which it could shine. And this led to the development of an organ of sight, for light is truly the creator of the eyes. The germinal human forms, which had hitherto been maintained by the common divine atmosphere, could now see their environment. This period is described in Genesis with the words, quote, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Close quote. The whole of the earth's body now began to revolve, and thus there were day and night. A great number of the spiritual beings who had surrounded the earth had gone forth with the sun. They formed the spiritual population of the sun, and from there exerted their influence on the earth. The etheric human forms were now furnished with an astral covering. The united body of earth and moon was surrounded by an astral atmosphere, which had previously been dissolved in the spiritual atmosphere. The ether, which had earlier existed as the basic substance, had now condensed into independent etheric bodies surrounding the separate physical forms, which, in their turn, had become denser. In contrast to the etheric body, however, the astral body had as yet no independent existence. There was still a common astral covering for all beings. This was the Earth Spirit. The whole planet was bathed in wonderful beauty. It floated in glorious colors in the light ether and gradually condensed. Side by side with the ancestors of humanity, there were already forms of plants and animals destined to be man's companions. The plants were of the lower types, which have now become dwarf or miniature plants. The animals, too, had not yet acquired their present-day shapes. There were shining plants and animals that whirled through the ether. All were still of one sex. By degrees, solid mineral forms appeared. Previously, everything had been etheric, then airy, then watery. The various beings swam as though in water or flew as though in air. Now, the earth developed a solid skeleton of rocks, parallel with the development of the human skeleton. Bone formation and rock formation went hand in hand. The human form at that time was something like a fish bird. Most of the earth was still watery, and the temperature was still very high. This watery element contained in solution much that later on became solid, our present-day metals, for instance, and other substances. Human beings moved in it with a swimming, floating motion. They were well able to endure the tremendous heat which reigned on Earth. Their bodies were still constituted of a material which corresponded to the prevailing conditions, and in this way they could live. Small continents on which human beings could roam about were embedded like islands in the water, but the whole earth was riddled with volcanic activity, which constantly destroyed parts of it with immense violence, so that elemental destruction and rebuilding went on continually, turn by turn. As yet, man had no lungs. He breathed through tubular gills, but he was already a very complex organism. He had deposited in himself a backbone. The earth became more solid. The water withdrew and separated from the solid parts. The air developed its own purity. And under the influence of the air, the swim bladder changed into lungs. Man now raised himself out of the watery element, a specially important and significant event. The gills were transformed into other organs, in particular into those of hearing. With the development of lungs, man learned to breathe, and then all mankind lived in a common element, the air. 
Each human being breathed in his portion of air, shaped it to his own form, and breathed it out again. In the beginning, therefore, man was filled with pure spirit. On the old moon there were beings who were at a higher stage of evolution than the humanity of that time. These were the gods, who in Christian tradition are called angels and archangels. They had once been at the human stage, but in the course of time they had ascended higher, just as we too will have ascended higher when we reach the next planetary stage. Although they no longer had a physical body, they were still connected with the earth. They were no longer subject to human needs, but they needed human beings to rule over. When the old moon had completed its evolution, some of these gods had not fully evolved with it. They had to remain as they were. They had not progressed as far as they should have done. Thus there were beings halfway between gods and men, demigods. They became especially important for the earth and for humanity. They could not rise completely beyond the human sphere, but equally they could not incarnate in human bodies. They could establish themselves only in one part of human nature, so as to use this part for furthering their own evolution, and at the same time to help mankind. On the moon they had breathed fire, and in the fire which had become permanent in man, in the warm human blood, the original seat of passions and desires, they took up their abode and imparted to man some of the fire which had been their element on the moon. These are the hosts of Lucifer, the Luciferic beings. The Bible calls them the tempters of humanity. They tempted man in so far as they lived in his blood and gave him independence. Without these Luciferic beings, everything would have come to man as a gift from the gods. Man would have been wise, but not independent, enlightened, but not free. Because these beings anchored themselves in his blood, man not only became wise, but could be fired with enthusiasm for wisdom and ideals. At the same time, however, the possibility of error arose. Man was now able to turn his back on the highest and to choose between good and evil. The Lemurian race gradually evolved with this disposition, this inherent possibility of evil. And in consequence, the earth had to endure great upheavals, convulsions, and earthquakes. In the end, Lemuria was destroyed through these passionate impulses of mankind. Meanwhile, the earth had undergone further changes and had become more solid. Other continents had arisen, and most important among them was Atlantis, between present-day Europe, Africa, and America. The descendants of the Lemurian race had spread over this continent. In the course of millions of years, they had greatly changed and had acquired a form which resembled the form of man today. Yet they were very different from modern man. The shape of the head and forehead was quite different, the forehead was much lower, and the organs of eating which were much more powerfully developed. The etheric body of an Atlantean extended far beyond and around his head. In the etheric body there was an important point which corresponded with a point in the physical head. In the course of Atlantean evolution the two points drew together until the point in the etheric body sank into the physical. At the moment when these two points coincided, man could begin to say I to himself. Self-awareness began. All this happened first among those Atlanteans who dwelt in the neighborhood of modern Ireland. The Atlanteans gradually evolved through seven sub-races, Romoals, Tlavatli, and Primal Toltecs, Turanians, Semites, Akkadians, and Mongols. It was among the Primal Semites that the unification of the two points first occurred, and clear self-consciousness arose. The two following sub-races, the Primal Akkadians and Mongols, really went beyond the goal of Atlantean humanity. Until the two points were thus united, the soul powers of the Atlanteans were fundamentally different from our own. The Atlanteans had a much more mobile body, and especially in their early times a very powerful will. 
They were able, for instance, to replace a lost limb. They could make plants grow, and so on. Thus they exercised a powerful influence over nature. Their sense organs were more strongly developed. They could distinguish different metals by touch, just as we can distinguish smells. They still possessed also a high degree of clairvoyance. Their sleep at night was not like that of modern man, who mostly has only confused dreams. It was rather a dim sort of clairvoyance. During the night they were in touch with the gods, and what they experienced lived on in myths and legends. They pressed the powers of nature into their service. Their dwellings were partly natural structures and partly hewn out of rocks. They constructed airships which were not propelled by inorganic forces such as coal, but by the use of the organic germinating power of plants. As long as the two points I've mentioned were not yet united, the Atlanteans had no reasoning intellect. For instance, they could not count. But to make up for that, they had particularly well-developed memories. A logical, reasoning intellect and self-consciousness emerged only with the fifth sub-race, the primal Semites. Atlantis perished in a vast water catastrophe. The whole continent was gradually flooded, and most of the people migrated eastward toward Europe and Asia. One of the main groups passed through Ireland and Europe to Asia. Everywhere, numbers of people remain behind. They were led by a high initiate in whom the migrants had complete faith. Through his wisdom, he picked out the best of them to accompany him to a distant part of Asia, where he settled them in the district now known as the Gobi Desert. There, a small colony developed in complete isolation. From there, colonizers went out into all inhabited lands and founded the civilizations of the next root race, the Indian the Persian, the Egypto-Chaldean Assyrian, the Greco-Latin, and then the Anglo-Saxon Germanic civilization arose. At the same time that the sun went out from the earth, the earth began to turn on its axis, so that at one time one side of the earth would be shown upon by the sun, and at another time it would be not be shown upon. Thus day and night began. But at that time the days and nights were much longer than today. At the time when the moon had not yet split off, whenever such a human form, already considerably condensed, was on the sunny side, there was organized into this gas mass, something of such an animal form below, in the water earth. Human and animal forms were combined, so that there was a human form above and an animal form below. The upper part protruded toward the sun, but the lower parts were weaker and the animal body joined itself to them. The upper part protruded out of the water earth, and the sun influence, proceeding through the flower men, worked on the inner forces of earth and moon. Because here an animal form was joined to the human body, which was then at the fish level, it was said that the sun, which illuminated the human body, stood at the sign of the fish. The first hint of this formation actually coincided with the sun's being and the sign of the fish but the sun passed many times through this sign before the next formation took place. The beginning of this formation, however, was the time when the sun stood in the zodiacal sign of the fish. Now, as, as we know, evolution proceeded in such a way that moon and earth formed one body. At the separation of the sun, Yahweh remained with the earth along with the moon forces, and among his ministers was the godly form the Egyptians called Osiris. Until the moon left the earth, evolution proceeded in a strange way. We know that the earth was a water earth, and the formation in the water attained an ever lower stage during the time preceding the departure of the moon. When the moon withdrew, man's lower nature was at about the stage of a great amphibian. This is what the Bible calls the serpent, and what is elsewhere called the lindworm or dragon. During the time when the moon was withdrawing, more and more, the animal kingdom had worked itself into the lower human form. When the moon finally left, man had a hideous, animal-like form in his lower parts, although above he still had the last remnants of a light form into which the forces of the sun flowed from without. It was still possible for the light beings to work into man. He moved about in the primal ocean, 
floating, swimming, with this remarkable light form protruding out of the water earth. What was this light form? In the course of time it had transformed itself into a powerful and comprehensive sense organ. When the moon withdrew this transformation was complete. When man swam in the primal ocean, if some dangerous being approached him, he could perceive it with this organ. Especially could warmth and cold be perceived with it. This organ later shriveled up so that today it is the so-called pineal gland. At that time man moved within the earth mass, floating and swimming, using this organ as a sort of lantern. In very young children, we still find a soft place in the head and it was from there that this organ protruded into cosmic space. The important thing is that we should relate every symbol to some actual vision, to something really seen. There are no symbols, no legends that have not first been seen. The Egyptian pupil could penetrate to such mysteries only after a long time. He was first prepared through a definite course of instruction, which was somewhat similar to basic theosophy. Then only was he admitted to the real exercises. There he experienced a sort of ecstatic condition, which although not yet true clairvoyance was more than a dream. In this condition he beheld what he was later to see in the form of pictures. The pupil actually beheld in a mighty living dream the departure of the moon and of Osiris with it, and Osiris's working upon the earth from the moon. He dreamed the Osiris-Isis legend. Every pupil dreamed this Osiris-Isis dream. He had to dream it, for otherwise he would not have been able to come to a perception of the true facts. The pupil had to go through the picture, the imagination. The legend of Isis and Osiris was inwardly experienced. This ecstatic soul condition was a preliminary to the true vision, a prelude to his seeing what takes place in the spiritual world. What has been described today could be read by the pupil in the Akashic record only when he had reached a high degree of initiation. Out of precisely this fundamental feeling developed the sacred doctrine of the ancient Indian initiates which appears like a spiritual image of that primeval state of the earth when it still contained the sun forces and high beings for whose sublimity man later yearned. Hence it was a great moment in his spiritual life when the pupil was initiated and could allow to arise within him what was grasped as Brahman. This was a mighty event in the human soul. It was arising into higher worlds. In no other way could a man be initiated and achieve real vision than by rising into higher worlds. The world around us is the physical world. Within and around it surges the astral world. Higher stands Devakan, the world of the gods. The pupil must penetrate to the highest regions of Devakan if he is to feel Brahman, the primeval self, in the macrocosm. Then he is in highest Devakan, the world of the gods whence springs the noblest that is in man. It was a realm of the highest and most perfect order into which the pupil was transported, a realm that offered much knowledge in addition to what has been described here. Before we go any further, we must learn to know the teachers also. All of you have heard of the holy Rishis, who were the original founders of the ancient holy Indian culture and had Manu for their teacher. Who were these seven great teachers of ancient India? As far as possible, we must explain the nature of the holy Rishis. This requires us to look again into the universe. We must be quite clear that what we perceive with the physical senses is a result of what is spiritual. If we think of the entire surrounding world as spiritualized, we can compare it with a primeval etheric mist. This mist then gradually became denser. It descended into the condition of matter and, of, and the various heavenly bodies condensed out of it. Sun, moon and earth detached themselves. But why did the other planets split off? For it also occurred that Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus and Mercury detached themselves. Why did this happen? We shall understand this if we realize that in the great universe there occurs something similar to an event in our trivial everyday life. It is not only in school that pupils sometimes fail to be promoted, but also in the cosmos there are beings who remain behind and cannot progress with the others. Let us be quite clear about this. 
There was one group of higher beings who could not continue with the Earth's tempo. These abstracted the finest substances and formed therefrom the sun as their dwelling place. These were the highest beings connected with our evolution, although they also had gone through an evolution of their own. Thus there were beings who were in the act of becoming sun spirits, and others who had remained behind, standing lower than the sun spirits, but higher than man. These could not continue with the sun spirits because they were not equally mature. They could not go out with the sun, for it would have scorched them. But on the other hand, they were too noble for the earth. Therefore they abstracted certain substances which were between sun and earth in fineness and corresponded to their nature and built themselves dwelling places between the sun and the earth. <clears throat> Thus Venus and Mercury were separated off. Here we have two groups of beings who are not as high as the sun spirits but are further along than man. They became the spirits of Venus and Mercury. These are the beings who caused the appearance of these two planets. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were formed earlier for other reasons, and they also became dwelling places for certain beings. Thus we see how spirits caused the appearance of these planets. Now one should not believe that these beings inhabiting the various bodies of the solar system have no connection with the inhabitants of the earth. We must see that the physical boundaries are not the real boundaries, and that it is possible for the beings of the other heavenly bodies to exercise magical influences upon the earth. Thus the influences of the spirits of the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus and Mercury extend into the earth. The two latter stand nearer to the earth and after the sun had withdrawn they helped men to prepare the earth as we have it today. Astronomers know nothing of the mysteries behind this because in the past it was not desired that the esoteric names should be revealed. This happened in order to conceal certain things. All these spirits of the other planets influence the earth. From every planet influences descend upon man. To begin with, however, these influences had need of an intermediary. Through the great Manu this was provided by the seven Rishis being initiated in such a way that each understood the mysteries and the influences of a single planet. Since there were seven planets, there were seven Rishis, who collectively formed a sevenfold lodge that could transmit to the pupils the secrets of the solar system. We find hints of this in many ancient occult writings. When, for example, it is said that there are mysteries beyond the seven, the reference is to those preserved by the holy Manu himself concerning the time before the splitting off of the planets. The forces preserved by the planets were the subject of the mysteries of the seven Rishis. This choir of seven Rishis, in complete harmony with Manu, cooperated in the wonderful wisdom that was transmitted to the pupils. If we were to characterize this, we would have to say that this primeval teaching contained approximately what we learn today as the evolution of humanity through the planetary conditions of Saturn, Sun, Moon, Earth, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. The mysteries of evolution were secreted in the seven members of the Lodge, each of whom typified one stage in the progress of humanity. The pupil saw this, not only saw it, but heard it when he raised himself into Devakan, into the Devakanic world. But this is a world of tones, there he heard the harmony of the spheres of the seven planets. In the astral world he saw the picture, in the Devakonic world he heard the tone, and in the highest world he experienced the word. On Saturn resounded the first breath of the Veda word. Evolution had now progressed through the sun and moon stages as far as the earth. The word had become continually denser, had taken on ever denser forms, and the picture of man in the primeval seed of the earth was already a condensation of the condition in which the primeval word existed on Saturn. What had happened here? The divine word, primeval man, had sheathed itself in ever new coverings, and we must see what sheaths the word assumed in the evolution of the earth. The pupil knew that nothing in the universe repeats itself exactly, and that each planet has its mission. 
what on the ancient sun he saw shape itself as life, what on the ancient moon was injected into the foundation of all things as wisdom, was followed by the task or mission of the earth, which is to develop love. This was not yet present on the ancient moon, what was present on the latter planet in a much more spiritual, but also in a much colder form, the primal image of man clothed itself in a warm astral covering. On the moon, what man was supposed to become was clothed in a warm astral sheath, and it is this part which on earth enables the inner human life to develop love from the lowest to the highest form. To the Indian pupil, the human form, the primal image, became clearly perceptible in higher Devakan. In lower Devakan, it then surrounded itself with an astral sheath, which contained the forces for developing love. Love, or Eros, was called Kama, K-A-M-A. Footnote, Kama is a Sanskrit word meaning desire, the nature of the astral body. In the ancient culture, excuse me, in the Egyptian culture, there still reigned the, that principle which in India reigned among those wise rishis who guided affairs, who transmitted the planetary forces, who were the pupils of Manu, the great teacher of that first sublime culture. In the first post-Atlantean culture, it was the rishis who brought the sublime teaching that led man into lofty spiritual worlds, even into the world of higher Devakan. In the succeeding cultural periods, what was seen there was led down as far as the physical plane. Until the fourth post-Atlantean period, there continued to descend into the physical plane that being whom we learned to know as Brahman in the Indian period and whom we now designate as Christ. No longer does he transmit the spiritual. He himself became man in order to radiate over all men the mysterious power of the primal word. Thus the primal word descended, in order that it might lead man upward again. Man must understand how that happened if he is to make himself an instrument through which he can work into the future. We must learn to know what happened before our time, so that we ourselves can cooperate in an ever higher molding of what exists around us and for us. We must create a spiritual world in the future. To do this, we must first understand the cosmos.